First, you have some time to read questions 1 to 3. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 3. Hi, sit down please. How can I help you? Thank you. I'm a student in the sociology faculty. I'm coming to ask for some information about renting a room in the college or near the campus. My name is Sarah. Yes, Sarah. How long have you been here in Sydney? You are not new, I suppose. No, I'm in my second year. I came to Sydney 18 months ago, from Korea. Where are you living now? I live with my aunt, in my cousin's room. It's pretty nice to live with my relatives, but unfortunately my cousin has finished his term and is returning from Britain next week. I have to rent a room for myself. Mm, yes, it sounds a little unfortunate, but I suppose it's a good chance for you to have a deeper understanding to real world. I hope so. Well... What sort of thing are you looking for? Uh, what we provide ranges from shared flat to homestay. And of course we have houses with gardens if you like. No, the house with a garden is obviously out of my price range. Shared flat is not bad, but I prefer a homestay. I enjoy the feeling of living with the family. When do you plan to begin the rent? Next week, you just said? No, my cousin is arriving by next week. So I hope to move out by this weekend. This weekend, okay. The main area we deal with is around the university. Around the university, aha. Uh -huh. Do you have anything near the northern gate of the university? You know, the sociology faculty is near the northern gate. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 4 to 10. Yes. Uh, what sort of price are you thinking of? Well, could you give me some idea? You know, I have no experience of renting a room. I don't know what price is reasonable. But I hope it's not over $300. I see. Usually the homestay ranges from $180 per month. Only $180? Yes, to $350, depending on a number of different factors. What does it depend on? Well, obviously, the quality of the house, the facilities, and extra services. Oh, I don't care about the quality very much, as long as it's clean. As to the facilities, I want the room with the separate bathroom. Kitchen isn't a necessity, because I don't want to cook by myself. I hope to have meals with the family, if possible. Okay, let me check the files. Mm, yes, I think this one might suit you. It's a family house with two vacant bedrooms. How about the owner of the house? I mean, is it a family, or...? Uh, according to the file, it is a retired lady. She wants to find college students as tenants. That's great! What's the condition of the rooms? The bigger bedroom is furnished and with a bathroom, and the rent is $320 per month. The smaller one charges $250. It is furnished too, but without bathroom. Oh, $320. It's a bit out of my range, but I think I prefer the bigger one. How about the meals? Well, the rent includes breakfasts and suppers. No lunches, however. You have to buy your lunch. That's no problem. I usually have my lunch in the college cafeteria. And that doesn't cover the water bill and electricity fee, but the laundry is included. Fine. Could you tell me the address? Yes, it's on 323 West Park Road. Let me get that down. 323. OK, it's near the university. So, when can I have a look at the room? You know, I'm a little pressed for time. The file says the landlady is in every afternoon. So, this week, say, Friday? Oh, I'm afraid I can't make it then. 
I have a lecture on Friday afternoon till 5.30. How about Thursday? Okay, that's fine. Would five be okay? Yes, fine. Just come here. Yes, here in the student service office. Oh, before I forget, before moving, you have to pay one month's rent in advance. Really? Oh, I didn't know that before. Could I ask why? As the deposit. You know, in case you damage the property or move out without giving notice. Usually this doesn't happen, but standing in the owner's shoes... Yes, I understand it all. So that's $320. OK, I'll take the money. If I'm satisfied... Well, a word of advice. Don't forget to get a receipt when you pay the deposit or rent. Yes, thank you so much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, and thanks everyone for coming here today. I know it's always a bit stressful going for a job interview, but it's best to be prepared. For any of you who may not know me, my name is Fiona Ogilvie, and my job is to offer guidance and support for students with special needs. Now, you wouldn't be here today if you weren't interested in finding a job in the holidays. So let's get down to it and see what things you need to be looking out for. Most of you, I hope, will be applying for jobs with the companies that have been recommended by the university. The reason for this is that we here at the university already know these companies and have established good working relationships with them. I've also been to visit all of them and checked out the facilities they have to offer. You really need to make informed choices when you're looking for a job and make sure you know before you even get to the interview stage that your needs will be met. But I know that some of you are applying for jobs independently and have looked at companies outside the university recommended list, so for you it's best to plan ahead and be aware of what it is you may need while you're working. Things that you need to check when you go for an interview are Are there enough toilet facilities and are these easily accessible? Also, you want to check that all the public areas inside the building are barrier free so you can get direct access to these public spaces whenever you need to. And ask about ramps into the building, so you know how many there are and where they are located. These kinds of things are so much more difficult to sort out when you've started work, as they take time. But ramps are an absolute must, so please make sure you know where they are. Another thing you must make sure of is that the lifts have the correct lowered control panels. Ask if all the lifts have this facility, or if it's only certain ones. Now, something I think that is often overlooked is working hours. What you want to make sure of is that you get flexi time. This basically means that your working hours are flexible and you can clock on and clock off in times that suit you. Within reason, of course. 
Most companies do recognise that it takes much longer for someone in a wheelchair to get on and off buses and trains. Public transport can take that much longer, so you need to be organised and prepared. And for those of you lucky enough to own a car, check how many disability parking spaces are available. Remember that it's your right to have a disabled parking space. These also need to be near enough to a wheelchair accessible entrance or ramp. Okay, are there any questions before we move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Right, let's move on then. Now I want to talk you through the series of visits to companies which we've got planned for next week. On Monday morning, we will be visiting the Lowland Hotel. They have various summer jobs available, working as a receptionist or conference organiser in their busy conference centre, organising and setting up conferences. You need to be prepared for working in an office environment and spending quite a bit of time talking on the telephone. The bus leaves for the hotel at 9am, so make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to get there. When you arrive at the hotel, please gather in the reception area and wait for someone to take you to your first session, which will be a talk. The talk at the hotel will begin at 10am and then there will be a short tour of the hotel. There will be a light lunch provided, which is usually salads and sandwiches. The next place we'll be visiting will be on Tuesday afternoon. We'll be going to visit a little local company that makes handmade paper and cards. For those of you studying art, this may be just what you're looking for. We'll be taken on a tour of the company, which lasts three hours. The tour will start at 3.30pm, and after that, you'll have a chance to meet some of the staff. Tea and coffee will also be provided. We have no trips planned for Wednesday, but on Thursday morning, we'll be going to Tobago Travel Agency. This is a very popular choice amongst our students, because you can get student discounts on holidays. We've booked a coach for this, and it'll leave from outside the refectory at 8 a.m. You'll need to bring a packed lunch for this, so please don't forget. There is a little canteen where you can buy hot and cold food, but this is closed on Thursdays. Friday, we'll be having representatives from all the companies visiting us, so you will have a chance to ask any questions, and of course, put your name down on the list if you're interested in working for them over the summer. This event will take place in the main hall next to the library, and it'll run from 10.30 until 4. I really hope you make the most of this excellent opportunity to not only earn yourself some extra money, but also to gain experience of what it's like to work. And if you'd like to find out more, then please ask some of the students who worked last year. They're all wearing green badges and will be happy to speak to you afterwards. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two business studies students discussing a presentation they'll do on an article on working effectively in groups. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. So, Brad, what did you think of the article on group work? Oh, hi, Helen. Uh, yeah, it was pretty good, with helpful pieces of advice on how to make group work effective. I think we were lucky to be given such a straightforward text to present at the Management Skills Seminar. Yeah. Actually, shall we discuss it now? Have you got time? Sure. It's only a 10-minute presentation, so we just need to explain and then give our views on the main points raised in the article. I'll jot down some notes. Right. So, there are three main sections. I suggest we start with listening. Yeah, effective listening in groups, because it's not something that's frequently covered on courses in our field. No, and we should say that in the presentation. Yeah. And also, effective listening's pretty simple, you know. I don't think it's hard to learn. Well, people think it's easy, but in my experience, most of us tend to be very lazy listeners. OK, I wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> Something I do think we should emphasize is the power of the listener's posture, gestures, etc., in making speakers feel respected. Not that you're just waiting for them to finish before jumping in with your own ideas. Uh-huh. OK, right. Uh, the next section is on goal setting. Let's make sure we're clear what the article says on this. Yeah. Well, firstly, it says that all group members must be given time to explain their own goals. That's it, yeah. And then, did it say that the whole group should agree on common goals? That's a bit too strong. It's more that everyone's agendas should be equally acceptable. But it does say that goals have to be realistic, you know... Achievable within a particular time? You've got it. That's really what the article's saying. There isn't really any point in having ideals if group members know they won't come to anything within a reasonable period. So, I think a summary covering those points will be enough for that part of the presentation, don't you? Yeah. Now, the last section is about conflict resolution. Actually, I thought it was the worst part of the article. Me too. I don't think it went into sufficient detail on the issue. Actually, I thought it devoted too much space to it, but that it was all rather boring, you know? It didn't mention some of the more radical theories. Absolutely. I found that really irritating. Right. And also, I think it could have said more about conflict sometimes being healthy in groups. Absolutely. It just mentioned rather glibly about how we should avoid thinking of winners and losers and that quick resolution of conflict is always desirable. Without explaining what these terms mean? Well, it gives quite detailed definitions, but doesn't develop a proper argument. Right. So, for the presentation, I think we just give some definitions and... And then explain what we felt were the weaknesses in the article's treatment of conflict resolution. Yeah, good. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, let's think about what we have to prepare for the actual presentation. Well, I suppose we'll use PowerPoint, but I'm hopeless at using it, especially if it has any visuals. I really have to look into doing a course on it because I know I'll need it in the future. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm quite happy using PowerPoint and I'll put it together when everything else is ready. That's a relief. But yes, do that later. OK. Now, I heard the tutor saying we have to include some well-chosen quotations from the article. I'm not sure if we do. I'll email him to find out. No need. I can just have a look at the specs he gave us when he set the task. That'll be quicker. But the tutor definitely said we have to prepare a handout to go with the talk. I'm not really sure how we do that. Sarah did one last year. Who's she? She's doing the same option as me on marketing. I'll ask her advice on what to include. Great. So that just leaves the bibliography at the end. I suppose it'll mainly be articles. Yeah. So we'll just look on the web, and we can leave that till later. But we've been advised against that. 
Well, we could have a look through some journals in the library. I think we should start by looking through module handbooks. I think that'll give us some good leads. Yeah, you're probably right. So, that's all the topics. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now let's turn to shopping, which may interest you more. In general, shops open at 9 o'clock in the morning and close at 5.30 in the afternoon. In country towns and quieter suburbs, smaller shops close for an hour at lunchtime, and once a week there tends to be an early closing day when most shops shut during the afternoon. Many cities have a late night once a week when shops stay open until approximately 8 o'clock in the evening. You should ensure that anything you bring into the country, such as travelling irons, heated rollers, hair dryers and electric shavers, can be used on the standard British voltage, which is 240 volts, 58 Z. Many hotels will, on request, be able to supply adapters for electric shavers. When you travel, you may want to send postcards home. Stamps can be bought at post offices throughout Britain. They are open from 9 o'clock to 5.30, Monday to Friday, and until 12.30 on Saturday. Stamps can also be bought at postal centre stamp dispensers, at large stores and major tourist attractions. For posting letters, you don't have to go far before finding a red painted letterbox. Alternatively, use the letterboxes at post offices. You may ask how much to tip in hotels and how much it is for a taxi. There are no fixed rules on tariffs about this and the following is intended only as a guide to customary practice. Most hotel bills include a service charge, usually 10 to 12 percent, but in some larger hotels 15%. Where a service charge is not included, it is customary to divide 10 to 15% of the bill among the staff who have given good service. In restaurants, if a service charge is not included in the bill, then 10 to 15% is usually left for the waiter. For porters, we usually give 30p to 50p per suitcase. For taxis, 10 to 15% of the fare. Hairdressers, Two pounds according to how much work they have done, plus 50p to the assistant who washed your hair. If you drive in Britain, you should remember to drive on the left and overtake on the right. The wearing of seat belts is compulsory for the driver and front seat passengers. Now let's talk about full details of Britain's road regulations. A copy of the Highway Code can be obtained from offices of the Automobile Association, AA or Royal Automobile Club, RAC, at most ports of entry. These two motoring organisations can also provide plenty of helpful information to all motorists. Contact AA 
telephone is 01 854 7373 24 hour service. RAC telephone is 0304 204 256 24 hour service. For something more serious, telephone operators will give you the telephone number and address of a local doctor's surgery. Alternatively, you can go to the casualty department of any general hospital or, in the case of severe emergency, dial 999. 999 is free. Remember, unless you belong to a European community country or one with which the UK has reciprocal health arrangements, you will be charged for the full cost of medical treatment in Britain, except in the case of accidents or emergencies requiring outpatient treatments only. It would therefore be wise to take out full medical insurance before leaving home. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Mm -hmm.